This is Sporting Life. Well, welcome along to the Sporting Life Racing Podcast. We're going to look back at all weather finals there, the action in Dubai, and some of the big news stories of recent days. David Ord in the company of Graham Cunningham, Billy Nash, and David Johnson. But GC, just before we started recording, the tragic news came through from Australia: the death of Stefano Churchy following his fall at in Canberra earlier in the week. I mean, it's hard to find words to do justice to the story. Uh, hello, Dave. Hi, everyone. Hope everyone's doing all right today. What can you say? Um, it, it's impossible to to say anything that's anywhere near adequate, so I won't. But I will use someone else's words here. Um, lots of tweets of sympathy coming in for obvious reasons. How about this? Owen Walsh, young Irish jockey who had been, along with Stefano, doing okay, ticking along, 100 and odd winners in the UK. Here's what Owen tweets this morning. Back in October last year, Stefano and I spoke about moving over to Australia. Bleep it, mate. Let's do it, I said. I wish this conversation had never happened. The kindest guy I've ever met, and it's been an absolute pleasure babysitting you the last few years. I'll never forget you. So I don't think you can put it any better than that. There's another tweet that caught my eye, lads, as well. Uh, Tommy Berry, who I became quite friendly with in Hong Kong, world-class Aussie jockey. He's tweeted his sympathies and condolences to the Churchy family today. No surprise about that. Tommy's a good guy. It's 10 years today since Tommy's twin brother, Nathan, died after the effects of a heavy fall in Singapore. So it is a, it's a completely unforgivable game. We're on a podcast, and in the next year, we'll chuckle about things and we'll moan about things. And it's all... It's all pretty trivial, really, when you when you set it against news like this, isn't it? Absolutely. And it goes without saying thoughts with the family and friends of Stefano. Such horrible news that came through um, on Wednesday morning. So we're going to start our podcast now looking back uh, at the action from All Weather Finals Day at Newcastle. Big crowds, competitive action. Is, is it a rare bright spot on the British calendar, this one now? Well, I think it is, isn't it? You know, um, obviously moving on from that terrible news in Australia, this this did seem a bit of a bright spot for uh, for British racing. Crowds at Newcastle, they were up at Lingfield. I think Lingfields were over 9,000, nearly 10,000 this year. They were 9,000 last year, up from 7,000 in 2022. And, you know, for Lingfield to be at almost five figures when... You know, most of their meetings, let's be frank, probably usually attract only three figures. You know, it's obviously a, a significant day for for all weather racing. And uh, I think um, a lot of the results, so they were really good to see, weren't they? Uh, both tracks put on really competitive racing. And uh, the one I really liked was watching Pandora's gift uh, win the last at Lingfield. Um, you know, she was smashed off the boards that big crowd. They'll have gone home happy. And you'd like to think that uh, any first start. Uh, second time race goers they could easily get hooked on that and come back again so uh, yeah i thought there was a lot to take from uh, from uh, from the day as a whole that was uh, fairly positive and gc it's meant to signal the end of the sort of all weather season i know it continues out the calendar year but with the the heavy ground the desperate state of the turf courses i mean i'd imagine one or two trainers will be utilizing it with some yeah. quite big names in the build up to new market No question about it. We saw Dubai Honor limbering up for Hong Kong uh, at Kempton on Monday. Uh, no question about it. And and you can't have a thriving aspect of the game like that without knock-on effects for other aspects, i.e. the turf season. We're going to come on to that in a moment or two. But no, I think David touched on, on the main point right away there. Big crowds with a buzz, and you could hear it through the TV screen. The crowds roaring away as the fancied horses... Uh, obliged. So, uh, hard not to like what was happening on Good Friday. And David, did any horses, other horses on your radar off the back of it, you've got to follow either on the turf or some, some more races on the all-weather coming up? Yeah, there's quite a few, I thought. Um, Clad covered an interesting one for James Tate. She won the Phillies and Mares, and I think they finally worked out what she definitely needs. You know, she's always been a keen goer. She got to the front too soon at Lingfield, a couple of starts back, and uh, I think... Um, they know now that she wants a hood and to be delivered late. Um, I think she's entered in the listed race at Kempton and over a mile, which would be uh, something that she'd have to prove. But uh, I do certainly think she is listed class. And 
The one that's really interesting for me, though, is this Al Bashir, who um, didn't fire on the day in the uh, all weather sprint final. But um, it's this handicapping that's the interesting thing. He's gone up to 110 for winning twice on the all weather, but his turf mark's been left alone on 100. Now, you look at the way that he shaped in that air gold cup um, last season from that same yeah. mark. I think this horse is definitely still well handicapped. And uh, I don't know what the plan is, but um, I'd be uh, circling the Wokingham as the main port of call for him in the early weeks of the turf season. Will that uh, mark definitely stay on 100, David? Or might they, might they readdress it in the next few weeks before he goes back to the grass? Well, I don't know. He's got two published marks on the uh, BHA site. So um, if, if they wanted to have moved, he obviously started on the all weather with just the one mark. And then mm. they've given him the all weather mark for these two wins. So it's possible they may do it. But as far as I can see, if they wanted to run him in a turf handicap now, they'd be able to do it off a mark of 100. And don't forget Archie Watson, his trainer, won the Wokingham last year with St. Lawrence, didn't he? He did, yeah. Mm. Which I had forgot. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> an early walking into it. Well, what a what a what a start to the podcast. GC, you touched upon it there. The start of the turf flat season is it, firmly underway. We've lost about Blocklebank owing to a trip to Pontefract on Tuesday. Carl Burke, it's an old argument about how we start the campaign. He's now suggesting that the Lincoln needs moving back to the Saturday before the Craven meeting so that we start with a bang. It's an argument as old as time, isn't it? But yeah. do you think the time's come to make the changes? It is an argument as old as time. And when that time comes around, you need to check what you said last time. <laughs> and I think I, I've always been a little less enamoured by the idea uh, than some, but I'm happy to debate it again. Now, you would think that a bloke who left home at 5.30 a.m. on Saturday and got into Musselburgh, Musselburgh Tesco's Cafe, for a quick fainting sarni at quarter to nine, only to find that the very valuable meeting at Musselburgh had been washed out 20 minutes earlier, would be all in favour of moving the start of the flat back towards Craven Week. But I'll throw this over to, to David and to Billy for the Irish angle, and then I'll come back with perhaps one or two drawbacks to it. Go on, David. Set your case for the, for the British season. Yeah, I, I can definitely see the merits of it. I mean... Obviously, starting the Lincoln in the slot that it does and ending as late as what it does, it's a throwback to when everything shut down for the best part of six months. So with the all-weather programme as big and as thriving as what it is now, I certainly think there is grounds for having a look about whether we need to start out quite so early when it does start as a little bit of a damp squib. You do get um, heavy ground, risk of abandonment. So I can definitely see where he's coming from. And and another aspect of that is I do think it's time for start thinking about a fixed slot for all weather finals day because the all weather season runs obviously throughout the winter. But because of how Easter works and how Good Friday moves about, you could potentially have all weather finals three weeks apart one year compared to the next because of uh, how Easter falls. So I do think there is something worth looking at. But in truth, it probably ought to form part of a much wider discussion about fixtures and how the whole season goes. And Billy and Ireland, it seems there's a little <laughs> bit more momentum. Some of the big tracks, I mean, you, you start with a bang and the, there's racing at the curve of Leopard Sound. You do seem to get a bit more of early momentum going. I don't know about starting with a bang, Dave. They do start. They've chopped and changed a little bit over here. It, it was traditionally uh, Paddy's Day was the start of the flat season in Ireland. They've moved that a little bit. They've brought it back in recent years, back to kind of the, the weekend closest to Paddy's Day. So it started on the 18th of March this year at the Corra. Obviously, this year has been, weather's been really bad. The ground has been really wet. We've already lost a couple of meetings over here. Uh, it's not ideal. But the flat season in Ireland, it does take a while to, to warm up. OK, we start at some of the big tracks, but we're we're chopping and changing for a couple of weeks. It's it's really until Punchestown is finished with its, we're still kind of uh, national hunt focused over here. There's a flat meeting dotted in here and there. There'll be a couple of good ones coming up this weekend. But it does take a while to warm up. Obviously, we've only the one all-weather track here in Ireland at the moment, even though I believe that's about to change. There's there's moves afoot to start work at Tipperary. So whether that will have an impact on it, I don't know. But I think the way things are at the moment, I, I don't see, see there's any massive need for change over here right now. Just to round it off on, on the British side, lads, um, my, my reservations would be as follows. Carl Burke as people often do on this debate, is use the words, need to start with a fanfare, etc. I don't think you're going to get much of a fanfare 
by having the Lincoln later, just before the Craven meeting. Secondly, that's a very well-established meeting at Donny, shifting it, carries risk for Doncaster. What are you going to do with all those meetings like Red Car? Yes, it was abandoned. Uh, Catterick, Pontefract, all the little flat meetings that are taking place between now and the Craven. And perhaps most importantly, if you shift that Lincoln meeting, there's a right hole needs filling on Lincoln Saturday because you try asking ITV to make the Merse final at Newbury, that meeting, your highlight of a, of a Saturday. It, it's, it's, it's fraught with danger, this. And you, you look for improvements, and I get it, I get it completely, but they come, you know, they make some ripples elsewhere and, and, and they're, not easy, they're not easy gaps to fix. You say, yep, yeah, all weather can take up the slack. I'm not sure that's what people want. That would be the slot where I would fit put in a fixed all weather finals day. I think that would be perfect yeah, for yeah, it. Yeah. Well, that's what people need to do. You know, Carl Burke needs to say, here's what we do. Here's how we replace the Lincoln meeting. And and, and then we're, we're on the right track then. What about putting the Lincoln on National Day? So you get the spring double in the space of an hour. I mean, <laughs> I mean people keep saying they want the spring double back. Let's have it in space of an hour on ITV. Yeah, if I'd be satisfied with hitting a spring single, never mind the double. <laughs> Very true. Now let's talk about things that are easy to fix, Billy. We're heading to Dubai, Dubai World Cup night, August Rotan. The stewards note the horse either wins or runs badly, was the explanation. It was the latter on Saturday. It most certainly was, yeah. That was, um, you know, what about it? Talk about a damn squib to start off your season. That was a that was a real stinker from August Rodin. Um, yeah, look, he did it a couple of times last year. He managed to bounce back. You'd have to say there's there has definitely been some reputational damage done now, though. I mean, this was it was always a bit of a roll of the dice to bring him back this year. Uh, after the campaign he had last year, he finished on such a high. I was personally surprised they brought him back into training. This is definitely not the start they would have wanted. I'm not sure where he's going to go from here, Dave. I'm sure they'll bring him back and check him out, and we'll be told that he was fine. Um, where we're going to see him next, who knows? But yeah, it, it's it's it certainly hasn't done him any favors. I don't think. They've rebuilt him twice, David, famously off the back of the Guineas and the King George. I don't know, this one start of a scene, I don't know, does it feel more significant a hill to climb? Well, I think it does, to be honest, because um, even though he got all that form on soft and heavy ground as a two-year-old, we sort of began to believe Aidan when he said, oh, it was just the ground. You know, he's a lovely mover. He's so fluent. He needs quick ground. So, you know, you forgive the flop in the 2000 Guineas on heavy. It was good to soft in the King George and... Uh, here it was good, fast, decent ground. You know, there's just no real excuse, is there? I mean, don't get me wrong, it wasn't a case of being a... He was well-positioned given how the race unfolded, but he just wasn't going to be getting involved at any stage, was he? So, um, you know, when he's he's done what he's done that he has come back, you obviously can't bet against him doing it again, but it is going to be difficult for them because where do they go next? Do they go for the Tats Gold Cup where there's a good chance that he's going to be running on softer than good there, isn't there? Or do you wait for Royal Ascot? But do you really want to wait for Royal Ascot off the back of this prep? So, it, it, I mean, Aidan's uh, worked wonders with him before and with several horses, but this one's really going to leave him scratching his head, isn't he? Absolutely. I, I think... When you look at this, there are only two possibilities with Gus, aren't there? That there's clearly a problem, and it can only be one of two things. It can be mental, in that he just spits the dummy from time to time, or it can be physical. Call me old-fashioned. I don't think Valley Oil, Coolmore are going to fess up if there is a physical issue. But we have to, you know, abandon all journalistic credibility and get reckless. Um, you have to wonder whether there is a, a, a physical problem there. Just completely by chance, I met someone at Ludlow who's an interesting character. And this is well before, well before um, what happened on the weekend. And he said, do you think John Magny is going to let that fella loose on all those lovely Galileo mares? It's not happening. And that was even before the weekend. So I, I think Billy summed it up. Reputational damage, bang on. And, and, and stallion value damage has to be a, a significant concern with that fella. Now, the next time he appears is absolute crunch time, isn't it? Because you, you cannot just keep blowing out like this and, and there not be a reason for it. Can, can anyone name a world-class horse, a really world-class horse with multiple group ones, classics, etc., who's blown out three times in the way he has? 
tailed off. Real struggling. No, not not the complete blowout like that. As it no. was, it was Ascot esque, wasn't it? It was after two furlongs. You're just looking and thinking, mm. this isn't happening today. Yeah. Now, Billy, it did start well for the, for the lads uh, with Tower of London. I mean, I'm glad I didn't back him one of those handicaps at the back end last year when they got beat. I mean, how good could he be in this same division this season? Yeah, well, he's made a tremendous start to the season, Dave. Um, winning in Saudi, now coming on to win in Dubai. Uh, he won, of course, a, a handicap in Saudi off a mark of 112. So, I don't know. Again, there's talks about Melbourne for maybe at the end of the year. If he does go to Melbourne, he's going to have to carry a significant chunk of weight, you'd imagine. But, yeah, he's turning into a really strong stair. He's earned something in the region of 1.8 million in his career to date um, in win and place prize money. So, for a horse that's not top of the tree in Bally Doyle, that's, that's a lot of money, you know. Um, he looks like a really promising stayer, Dave. He again showed a tremendous turn of foot to win at the weekend. So obviously all those staying races are open to him. You'd have to imagine they might go down the Ascot Gold Cup route with him now. And like I said, maybe they'll they'll try and finish off his season in Melbourne. I think Michael Tabor in particular seemed quite sweet on that idea. So that's an option for him. But he has been a success story. I think he has kind of um, he has exceeded expectations in Bally Dial, as far as I can see. I just wonder if um, I'd be inclined to think they might take a different route to what Billy does with him. And uh, I mean, that speed, the turn of foot that he showed, um, suggests to me that he'd be more than happy coming back in trip. And obviously with Gus Rodan uh, bombing out like he did, he's got that Coronation Cup entry. I wouldn't be surprised to see him come Coronation Cup Hardwick, something like that, particularly if they get Kiprios back this uh, you know, Kiprios and him, they, they're chalk and cheese, aren't they? Kiprios is the real, you know, grinder, the stayer, where at Tower of London, he's just looking yeah. quicker and better with his racing. He ran 22 dead, the fastest closing sectional on the entire Dubai World Cup card. And it, it's interesting that, you know, they started the season as usual, valued all with a you know, really strong team of older horses. Gus Rodan plotted his copybook. Luxembourg, he mm. ran a very plain race at the weekend. And Tower of London... Here comes Tower of London on the blind side, looking at you know a potential Group One horse now. Interesting to see what they do with him next. And GC, a big night for Hong Kong in Dubai as well. It was, it was. Um, Straight Aaron ran really well. I think the sixth in the turf. Um, Voyage Bubble had a bad experience in the same race uh, when Catnip sadly suffered a fatal fall. But the star of the show was undoubtedly California Spangle. Tony Cruz's reinvented him recently he he'd look he was looking a bit jaded over a mile he kept seeing golden 60s backside time and time again by the way his form was polished more than once at the weekend that namur japanese philly she'd been blown away by golden 60 in hong kong but let's get back to Gold, um, california spangle he was the best horse in that race on ratings his run style was suited to the race and i'm not sure he had to improve at all so all the talk about Royal Ascot, yes, it'd be nice to see him here. I don't think what he achieved in Dubai would be good enough to win a QE2 Jubilee Stakes. It'd be nice to see him here, but it looks as if Tony Cruz is, is eyeing Japan rather than Ascot at this stage. These things can change, of course. Lots of articles at the minute about Charlie Appleby's 2024 prospects, David. He's going to have an impact on the classic scene, etc. Big winner at a big price um, on World Cup night for for Charlie and a, a, well, a good ride for William Buick. He was right place, right time. Yeah, absolutely, it was. Um, it's sort of like Buick winning the race as much as Rebels Romance, I think, mm -hmm. and uh, always had him ideally positioned. Point Lonsdale, you know, given the position that August Rodan was in, you would have expected him to be setting a faster gallop than what he did. And Rebels Romance was just ideally positioned in behind that. I think his time form rating is up to 125. And uh, for a horse that doesn't have a huge rating that suggests he's an absolute worldie, he's put together a pretty good yeah. CV, hasn't he? Um, you know, there's a Breeders' Cup turf on there, as well as the uh, Dubai Shima Classic. Um, as well Germany, as... did he win a big one in Germany as well, I think, didn't he? He did, yeah, group one, a yeah. couple of group ones in Germany by the looks of it, yeah. So, um, you know, fair play to the way that they've campaigned him and they've, they've taken out a big prize here, but... Um, I wouldn't at all be surprised to see the likes of Emily Upjohn reverse the form back in Europe if, if Rebels Romance does come back uh, and race over here as well. Yeah, the, the clock told an interesting story there, lads, on Rebels Romance. Point Lonsdale, Gus's pacemaker, did the absolute perfect job for Buick and Rebels Romance. Rebels Romance came home in 11.8, 11.3, 11 dead and 11.7. At this point, 
the main dangers, I'm not counting Gus, he was gone by this point, were seven or eight lengths behind, and they would have had to come home in 21 and three, 21 and four to have any chance. It's just not possible to do that. And it, it's weird to think that you go all the way to Dubai for a five million, five million sterling race and give yourself hardly any chance. So I'm looking at you, Yuga Kawada on Liberty Island, who I thought ran a super race in the circumstances. And I don't think Kieran Schumacher excelled himself on Emily Upjohn. She, like David said, she did more than enough to suggest she's worth another chance. But uh, all about tactics for five million in the desert. I think it's really good, though, that the data's out there, that we can have these discussions now, yeah. whereas sort of 10 or 12 years ago, we'd have just been there because it looked visually, you know, a well-strung out field would have been saying, yeah. oh, they've gone a decent enough gallop. Disappointing mm -hmm. runs there from Emily and, you know, the Japanese Philly Liberty Island. They just weren't good enough. Whereas when the data is there, you can look at it, analyse it and see, well, actually, they haven't gone quite as quick as what it looked. You might have skipped your attention, but on Saturday, the road to Churchill Downs, the Kentucky Derby, uh, ventures into Chelmsford for, for the conditions race there, where you can get European points. We do know from the um, Dubai World Cup card, Trevor Young, GC, is yeah. Kentucky bound. He's a good horse. Him, I saw him in Saudi, and I watched him, and was pretty impressed at the weekend. Now we know it's a big, big, big step from, you know, the UAE Derby to the Kentucky Derby. But he's now rated one one six p time form. It was a pretty emphatic success at the weekend, and it, it's just it's great to see a horse who's he's only just getting going in his three year old campaign, and he's already won good races in three different countries. And Yahagi is trainer, who's a real buccaneer is determined to go on and give it a crack at some point. Japan will crack the arc and they'll probably crack the Kentucky Derby uh, at some point. It, it's just great to see someone who's, who says, I've got a good horse and I'm going to put him on show around the world. Absolutely. Uh, let's talk about the, the French winner the turf. David, the horse is disappointing in behind some big names. What did you make of that race? It's one of those where it looks of something of a below par renewal, doesn't it? Factor Cheval right place, right time, when you think, you know, how many times he was coming up short in Group 1 company in Europe last year. He's beaten in the Dispahan, second in the Sussex, third in the Moulin, you know, stuffed in the QE2 when he was second behind uh, Big Rock. And uh, like I say, he was just in the right place, right time here to, to win such a valuable prize. Probably didn't have to improve by that much. And you're looking at the key British horses, the likes of Lord North, Nashua, they, they were just disappointing, weren't they? Luxembourg, probably uh, not the right kind of trip for him, but even so was struggling so far out. Uh, he just just wasn't himself regardless. I'd give Nashua a pass, David. Drawn 16 and kept way out wide early on and yeah, had to do a fair. lot of running to, to, to get a handy position. And I think she was beaten under five lengths, so I, I, I think it's it's fair to expect her to, to step up uh, a lot on that. Uh, no, Factor Cheval, he was a possibility for Hong Kong in April. That looks unlikely now. Seems a, a good character, this Jerome Renier, um, who trains, uh, well, she used to train Skeletti, good globetrotter for him. And he took Skeletti to Hong Kong when I was working there in 2020, when COVID was at its height. So he took the horse and he was there, but nobody could go anywhere. There were very heavy restrictions on all incoming travelers and I'm, I'm told uh, you never know whether these things are gospel but i'm told that he made a few requests to to make his stay a little more um comfortable one of which was <laughs> can you put can you put a billiard table in my room in my hotel room i don't think that happened and maybe the hong kong jockey club are regretting that now because he's not taking his stable star back to hong kong in april it's going to be ascot instead but a nice boost for uh, Big Rock and, and Paddington, etc., wouldn't it? Really good. It's quite interesting. There's a, there's a fair few rebuilds. August, the headline act for the rebuild, but there's a few Europeans to get back on track. Now, one man who can buy his own billiard table now, a Billy, is Tag O'Shea. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the big race of the night, the Dubai World Cup. It was great. It's in the Judmont Sills. What a great moment for him. He can buy his own billiard table and he can take money off you playing it as well, Dave. Um, yeah, it's chuffed to bits for TP. I know Tiger a long time. Um, you know, he's been tremendous in Dubai. He's been champion jockey there multiple times. Champion apprentice in Ireland twice back in the day as well, you know. Um, hasn't really had the opportunities over here, but he's like he's king of the king of the hill in Dubai, and it was fantastic to see him win the big race. He's had plenty of success on World Cup nights in the past. Brilliant to see him win the big race. Like that, I mean, 
Uh, just watching the race, I was thinking down the back, I was thinking this horse is going too fast. There's no way he'll keep this up. But you could see from when they turned out of the back straight, he wasn't going to get caught. It was an incredible performance. Obviously, some of the jockeys in behind would like to ride it again. But huge effort from Laurel River. Massive win too for Bupat Seymour. And yeah, I'm like I said, chuffed to bits for Tyg. Um, he's a, you know, I, like I've known him a long time. He, he's a great fella. Um, he'll have got as much kick out of taking a few quid off some fella playing snooker the, the morning before than he would have won actually winning the big race itself, you know. But uh, yeah, it's it, it was a super performance by all involved. Billy, do you know him from the John Ox days, Billy? Because I know he rode a nice winner or two for John Ox, didn't he? Uh, he didn't ride much for us, but yeah, he would have been an apprentice on the car at the time. So I'd have, I'd have, yeah, we'd have been knocking around together a fair bit at that stage. Yeah. And don't forget, he also won the uh, Dubai Golden Shaheen on the same night on on Tuz, who absolutely bolted up. So it was a pretty handy night for for O'Shea. And had a second as well. Yeah, he was unlucky; he didn't have a treble on the card. So yeah, he a great night all round. His best out in Britain food is rolling second jockey to hand on Al Mac too for so long. The Black Cap spotted in some. Some big races by tag. Another former Shadwell number two, Dane O'Neill, uh, announced his retirement um, in the week. Um, it's just saying serious injuries last week, um, last season, towards the back end. And lots of nice tributes paid to De- uh, Dane, a jockey a lot of people have got an awful lot of time for. Yeah, very much so. Um, he had a pretty good career, didn't he? Uh, I was remembering him. Uh, it was after, was it Chris Russell retired? He got on uh, Airwave and... Uh, it's worth trying to look out the video for when uh, he won the Temple Stakes on her. Um, I don't think I've ever seen a jockey take a pull halfway in a five furlong brute race. Uh, you know, where she was she was that good that day. And um, yeah, exactly. It's just a shame, you know, he's come to the end of his career. He's, um, and he, he wasn't able to go out on his terms, sort of forced upon him. But, uh, you know, when we go back to uh, how we started the show, it is fortunate that he goes out you know um, with his health pretty much uh, intact and uh, he's plenty of time to go off and do something else which isn't the luxury afforded to to all jockeys unfortunately yeah 30 year 31 year career it's a hell of a long time to be to be riding at such a high level and and just everyone always just regarded him as just dead dependable you know you'd never worry if you saw his name against your horse in in any race so no salute to Dane O'Neill let's go jumping Billy, let's go Fairy House. Um, the times they have a change in a six year old novice chaser wins the, the Irish Grand National. And I mean, it was a, it was a thrilling spectacle. What, what, what do you make of intense raffles? Where's he going to end up? That's a very good question, Dave, because if you look at it historically, the Irish National since 2000, only four horses have carried over 11 stone to win an Irish National. You had Comanche Court, uh, Our Duke, I am Maximus, and obviously intense raffles at the weekend. Now, I think. There has to be a little bit of an asterisk behind intense raffles because there was only 20 in the race. It wasn't, it certainly wasn't a strong Irish national uh, historically. There was like horses down the bottom you wouldn't normally expect to get into the race. Like he ran off a mark of 140, which of the four that have carried over 11 stone, that is the lowest mark. I mean, our Duke, the year he won it, uh, carried 11 4, he ran off a mark of 153. So, um, you know, it's it wasn't a particularly strong race, but still. Intense raffles. He's not been with Tom Gibney all that long. He's had three runs from him. He's won all three. He was an impressive winner at the weekend. If you were on him, there was rarely a moment in the race where you thought you were going to get beaten. Apart from a mistake, four out. Everything went swimmingly. And yeah, he's he's certainly going to warrant stepping up in grade. Whether, you know, people will be talking about, could he be a gold cup horse? At this stage, he's not even anywhere near that sort of conversation. But you'd have to think maybe a... a an entry national next year or something like that, you know, very much on the agenda. But spare a thought for Dal Jacob, friend of the show. I mean, I know he was he was very sweet on this horse's chance and it was just a, a cruel twist of fate that he wasn't able to ride him. But, you know, that's racing and, and JJ Slevin took took his opportunity with both hands. It did strike me that if the, this was the Grand Nash would have a BHA steering group launched immediately. There was 20 runners and a, a 148 top rater. But it does look like a calendar glitch almost, this, doesn't it? The late Easter and the proximity to Aintree. Yeah, it's an oddity. And then there's the broader discussion of um, how do you feel if you're connected with one of the handicappers who's been grinding away, showing your wares all winter, and you get done by a, a young horse who came from France not too long ago and has won a six-runner novice chase. And a forerunner of his chase, really tough to handicap. The handicap was obviously uh, airing on the generous side. So uh, as a wider debate, uh, along the lines of Patrick Mullins and others, others said after Cheltenham, 
should we be having these really unexposed novices in major handicaps? You can see the reason for wanting to park them somewhere else. But the question is, do we really have enough horses to fill the big handicaps nowadays without the youngsters? I think the answer's becoming quite obvious to that one. Now, Billy, clearly the British dominating the Mayor's Novice Hurdle Division. We decided not to come over, let you have a, a big race to <laughs> yourselves here. Jada goes you back to winning ways. Um, I don't know if that's a mare you really like. Really like her, Dave, and she justified my faith, I think, at the weekend because that was a hell of a, hell of a performance from a mare that had been to Cheltenham. Obviously, things didn't work out ideally for her there, but to come back and win over two and a half miles in the manner that she did, I thought that was a huge effort. Uh, she got a time form rating for that performance of 140p, so that puts her ahead of the two mares that beat her at Cheltenham Golden Ace and Brighter Days Ahead it's and Birdie or Bust, of course, who finished third. So she's currently top of that pile. Um, I think she's only going to get better and better. I mean, even if you looked at her in the parade ring at the weekend, there still looks like a, a bit of, um, you know, she can she can certainly fill out a small, but she's quite a tall mare. I think she's going to get better with age. She's by Dr. Dino, whose progeny tend to do that anyway. So I think, you know, she's going to be around the, the top table for a while this year. I think she's very good, Dave, and hopefully she'll get to prove it next year. What about Spillane's Tower? Really popular win that, wasn't it? Yeah, hugely popular win for Jimmy Mangan. Um, obviously, uh, best known over in, in Britain for his for Monty's past win in the National. But, you know, he's been a, a stalwart in the pint-to-pint -pint scene in Ireland for a long time and just showed at the weekend, as did plenty of other trainers, that given the opposition, they're, they're well able to, or given the ammunition, I should say, they're well able to do the job. Um, Spillane's Tower, fine performance. Didn't actually need to improve his form that much, Dave. Uh, we felt probably about, about a pound higher than he'd achieved previously. The step up or the step back to two and a half miles really suited him. And you'd have to say, looking at him, he's a horse that will improve again once he gets to go three miles. How high he's going to go, I don't know. It didn't look a particularly strong grade one. But he's relatively unexposed. He's quite likely raced. And there's surely more to come from him. But yeah, a great result for, for Jimmy Mangan. It can't be... Well, I, I suspect we've never been in a, in a position before where the green and gold of J.P. McManus has had such a powerful team of of young up and coming horses. You know, if you go back through Cheltenham, Majpura, I know the way you're thinking, back to file, Corbett's Cross, Spillant Tower, the uh, erratic I am Maximus, Capadano is a possible national horse. He's loaded at the moment, isn't he? Yeah. Yeah. Um Meeting of the Waters, Mirrors or West. Yeah. I mean there's yeah. there's loads of them there, yeah. And recruiting all the time as well, isn't he, Billy? He was shopping yeah. before Cheltenham. I'm sure it won't stop with some Lots of Twitter footage of horses in France is already snared for next year as well. So John Bond, seg you into the Henderson line, Dave. <laughs> beautifully done, beautifully done. Let's Thank talk you. Henderson. I, I mean, I wrote, the thing, I wrote the thing yesterday that he'd had eight runners since Cheltenham and one winner. Then he was one from one yesterday. So it's nine, nine runners, two winners since Cheltenham. But it, it's a big week for him, isn't it, GC Entry? If the big guns are to turn up, it, it's, a, it's a big test after what went on in that week building up to Cheltenham. It is, it is. And we're all guilty of doing, I, I think, silly things at times like this. Like, people will take the even money win of a Tupney Hapney novice hurdler at Ludlow yesterday as a sign that things are on the mend. Nicky Henderson must have, what, 150 horses or thereabouts. At any point in any year, certain members of that team will not be 100%. But I, I think if he, if he sends the stars to Aintree, and I hope he does, you have to assume that they've been thoroughly tested, not just recently, but for a period of a month or more, and that they're ready to rock and roll. So I, I think I think he has to, I think he has to, you know, provided the tests are coming out fine, to try and get literally back on the horse uh, next week and, and see what happens with John Bond, Shishkin and co. It, it's going to be a really tantalising element of Aintree next week. It, it will only take one or two horses to run a little below par, and the market moves for those horses will then get very lively indeed. But if he runs them, I'm happy to believe that they're going to be ready to, to revive. David, one horse that won't be running, Constitution Hill. Um, a, a, another twist, and sad one in that, sorry, that suspected colic in the Equine Hospital for a couple of days this week. He, he's back home now, thankfully, and feeling sorry for himself. Nico de Boinville said he saw him on Tuesday and the horse was looking to be feeling sorry for himself. We've talked about rebuild jobs with... August well down. All of a sudden, there is one now with Constitution Hill as well. There is, yeah, and um, there there will be uh, 
more significant doubts about uh, how much ability he can retain and whether he, he'll ever recapture the brilliant best that we've, we've seen from him because, uh, you know, um, he didn't have to be anything out of the ordinary to win the race at Kempton, did he? So you're going to get to the stage where when he reappears next year, it, it's going to be the best part of 18 months since he's put up one of those worldly performances. And, uh, you know, we see the strength that Mullins is amassing with his two-mile hurdlers. They're definitely going to be putting it up to him. And, uh, yeah, you do fear that um, it might be that the best of Constitution Hill has been seen on the back of this news. David, the one thing that struck me about Ames, just reading the sort of the build-up, and I'm sure this is the Mullins factor at play. Gordon Elliott seems to be sending a strong team, perhaps sacrifice one or two punches town, big players where they would meet the Mullins big guns to, to come pot hunting the grade ones in Liverpool. Yeah, it does look like that's um, the plan. I think Jerry Colomb ran there at the meeting last year, didn't he, with success? And uh, um, yeah, it does make sense. Uh, obviously, uh, the British uh, battalions aren't anything like uh, as heavy to take on as what uh, the force of Willie Mullins at Punchestown is, is it? So, you know, uh, we've seen the last four or five years, it really has been Mullins' domination totally at Punchestown. So I, I do think it, it does make sense. And uh, yeah, a, a good chance to use the line about uh, Jerry and a pacemaker at Liverpool, perhaps. <laughs> and you think, what, what, one that I want to see bubbling away is this Skelton Nichols title battle, because it's all friendly at the minute. It's bants and it, it's all... But you, you can bet down right by the time I get to Sandown, it'll be as competitive as hell if they're still within Kui of each other. Yeah, Paul Nichols taught Dan Skelton well uh, in many departments, uh, it, including how to be a good loser, but how to be a winner. And so they'll be going hammer and tongs. It won't get to the days, remember when Hypey was trying to hold off Nichols and he was sending horses to run twice in three days or on consecutive days from air down to sand down, etc. You're not allowed to do that anymore, I don't think. But no, it's, it's going to be pretty lively. It's a fairly arbitrary measure of what's a champion trainer prize money here and there. And, and one race here or there at Aintree uh, could swing it. But no, that's that's a nice little subplot for the next ooh, three weeks or so. Three weeks into three months we're going to talk about now. But it was the ban handed out to Tony Martin um, last week, I think. Where are you now with this story, with this development? Yeah, so <clears throat> Tony Martin if you remember, was given a six-month suspended sentence, suspended for two years. I think he had three horses in over the course of four years were, had failed drugs tests after winning races. So that was the initial sentence that was handed down. He was also suspended, or he was also handed a fine of, I think, €11,000. And the IHRB appealed this sanction, saying it was too lenient. And that appeal essentially was upheld. So instead of suspending six months of the sentence... They have now banned him for three months. The ban kicks in to uh, uh, it starts off on the fifteenth of May, so just a couple about a month's time, and Tony Martin will lose his license for three months. Now, in effect, not a lot will change. We have seen with the likes of Gordon Elliott, Dennis Hogan, Charles Burns, who've all lost their licenses over here in recent times. What will happen is the horses will be transferred into somebody else's name. Probably, um, it'll be you know just life as usual in, in the Tony Martin yard but somebody else holding the license for a couple of months but reputational damage again is a, is a big thing but Tony Martin is, is a well established trainer he has a very well established clientele so I don't think anybody is going to be leaving that yard because of this um, you know um, so like I said I, I don't think a whole pile will change but certainly when when you're handing out bands like that I don't think a suspended sentence is any deterrent whatsoever so I do think the fact that they have given him a three-month ban, at least the optics look a bit better now, I think. Appeals are galore at the minute, Jesse. That was a different one. What, jockeys are appealing against bans and getting yeah. partial wins? It, it seems that the, the ones who are going there and stating their case, uh, they're getting hurt. I, I haven't got the full data here, but I, I say that the, the sniff test is that, crikey, a lot of jockeys appeal their bans nowadays and quite a lot get a result, be it whole or partial. Just in the last week or so, I think Harry Cobden got his careless riding ban from Cheltenham rescinded. Patrick Mullins got a reduction on uh, his Cheltenham whip ban. Ryan Mania got, a, I think, a 14-day ban half down to seven. So the the results tell you that it's it's well worth a feeling nowadays. I like the fact that the fresh new hearing 
is a fresh new hearing, that people look at it with fresh eyes, but it does seem that the, the local stewards, and remember, they, they seem to have a bit more time on their hands these days because they don't have to deliver whip bands on the day. They're still seeming to, to get things a little awry here and there. In terms of interference, that's a different kettle of fish, but I must admit, as a, as a person who loves betting on stewards' inquiries, I don't do it in quite the gung-ho fashion I used to because I'm I'm not quite as sure about the way these commissars will will read the rule book as I used to be. David Oshie Murphy won't be appealing. He says he picked up six days, um, would have been eight on or whether Chappie David going one over. The, the whip story is that I don't think it's going to go away. No, and I think it was a really cleverly worded tweet or statement from uh, Murphy. Uh, he held his hands up, said, look, this is what I've done. The rules are as they are. But just pointing out, uh, you know, how ludicrous it really is, I guess. Um, you know, uh, I don't think anybody that watched the ride had a real issue with it visually. It wasn't like he was beating the horse up. He's literally gone just one strike over, which, as I've pointed out before, if it wasn't for how um, the the BHA taking a strike off them, you know, it wouldn't even have been um, an offence. And then, like he says, if it had have happened in a slightly less valuable race, the opening race on the day, it would have only been a two-day ban instead of uh, getting a full week. So, yeah, it's not going away. These are rules, they are what they are. And when jockeys break them, they are going to be punished. But when you look at it, you're just scratching your head thinking, surely this can't be the right way to be uh, carrying on. They've got us all counting, GC. We were all at it with Derek Fox and we were thinking he might miss the ride on Colat Ramblin. It was a real great... You, when you were playing the counting game yourself, it was difficult to, to yeah. set. I, I think... Uh, how shall we phrase? I think this, the BHA seemed to come up with an elegant solution here. Uh, the, you know, all sorts of people, myself included, with messaging our WhatsApp group, thinking Derek Fox is in trouble here, you know, um, in 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 view of how often he hit is it Clovis Boy, Clovis Bay at Newcastle. The BHA said that they adjourned his hearing because they wanted to ask him further questions. I think he does have a mobile phone, Derek Fox, as far as I'm aware. Uh, they chose not to give him a ring. I suspect those questions might relate to. Um, giving the horse time to respond rather than frequency. Either way, he really dodged a bullet there, Derek Fox, because he was very, very close indeed to missing the ride on the Grand National favourite. Billy, we are looming large towards Angel. Full preview next Wednesday, of course, of the great race and the supporting cards, and tremendous it is. I mean, British trained favourites for the um, the Randolph's Grand National, but everywhere else, it, it, the Irish team is so strong, and Mullins and Elliot... I don't think they're going to blink with many of them they've got entered at the minute, do they? They seem intent on... They're going to be big battalions coming over. Oh, I would think so, yeah. Um, like, we spoke about it last week, Dave. Obviously, you were listening in intently afterwards. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. My, yeah. my whole policy. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah, it looks like it's going to be... like There won't be that many British-trained runners in the race, not to mind. Um, you say that again. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah... Um, the, the Elliot and, and Mullins runners, I think pretty much everything that's that's guaranteed to get a run will run barring accidents at this stage. They're going to have very strong hands, the two of them. Uh, not just them, of course. Gavin Cromwell is another trainer who's going to have three or four very strong ones in the race. Henry de Bromhead is, is going to be double-handed or triple-handed. So, yeah, it's it's looking like it's going to be Irish domination again, Dave, I think. The British jockey agents will be getting busy, well, they're hoping that they might be able to pick up the odd one. Right? <laughs> There's going to be about 35 of them south. Watching it on the telly in the weighing room at, at this stage. Let's talk about the weekend. It's not, I mean, it's a premier racing weekend somewhere. I think it might be Telltale that's got that, got the badge for this weekend, but it's not really a, a Melbourne weekend of action. But David, you've got one for us at Kempton for working out well with. Yeah, um, it's uh, in the six furlong handicap that uh, finishes the card. And uh, the horse that's most interesting is this uh, Ferris of uh, Jack Shannon's, who uh, made a winning return uh, on his uh, reappearance at Wolverhampton. Uh, it was on the um, the Lincoln Trials Day card, so uh, you know quite a decent uh, handicap. And uh, it's just a race that's working out and been franked all ends up. Nebworth, who was second, uh, came out and won at Doncaster next time. Bosch, who was a narrowly beaten third, he came out. Oh, and won. Bosch. 
that's the one. He came out and won at um, Lingfield on the uh, consolation race at uh, Lingfield on Good Friday. And further back, Alvarez, who wasn't seen to best effect on the day at Wolverhampton, came out and won at Kempton on Easter Monday. So uh, bang, 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 or bosh, bosh, bosh. They, those three have gone in. And uh, Ferris comes here. I don't think uh, he's gone up too, too much in the weights. He won off a mark of 85. He's turning up here off 90. I still think that looks um, a very winnable mark and uh, not uh, giving away too many uh, secrets. Um, we know how uh, popular that Saturday Bankers column is that you can read on uh, a Sporting Life website. But uh, there's a good chance that uh, Ferris could be uh, my entry, uh, price dependent, of course. Oh, that's what we need to say. I think I was right. We are going to change that to Saturday Best Bets as well, rather than Bankers. That's a bit of a podcast exclusive there. Uh, they're doing a new <laughs> graphic. Billy, it's classic trial action on deep ground at Leopardstown. Um, numerically, AP O'Brien, as you would expect, dominates all the sort of key races, numerically, as I say. He does, yeah. The Bally Sacks, for example, there are 10 entered in the Bally Sacks and Aiden has eight of them. So, you know, we talk about the, the Mullins and Elliott domination over oh. jumps. It's, it's a similar kind of level on the flat. Um, he's got some very interesting ones, as you would expect, Possibly the most interesting is a horse called Ocean of Dreams, who was very, very impressive in a back end maiden. He's as low as 20 to 1 in the place for the Derby, but I see he has him entered in both the 2000 Guineas trial and the Bally Sack. So it'll be interesting to see how he splits his horses up. Um, he's got a couple of Chelsford, of course, in that um, uh, Kentucky Derby trial uh, well, on Saturday as well. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, like I said, it'll be interesting to see how he splits all these horses up. There's also a, a 1,000 trial. Again, that looks like a, a probably a more open race. The likes of Porta Fortuna, if she runs there, will be certainly will be uh, well clear on ratings. But there's a couple of interesting ones against her. Paddy Toomey's a lilac roller. We've seen Paddy Toomey has started the season well. His kind of two big guns, Purple Lily and one look have come out and won nicely. He also has deep one in the Beresford, who will put it up to the, the O'Brien battalions. Look, these races are always informative, and I've no doubt they will be informative again this week. But like I said, a lot will depend on what way Aiden decides to split his aces. Dave? Yes, JC? Before we finish, I think we should be a nice way to round off would be, especially for Billy, the mighty limestone lad departed last week. What an incredible horse that was. What are your almost vivid memories of that horse, Billy? Well, I suppose the one that stands out, and it probably stands out to most people, was him beating Isterbrack that, that day he lowered the colours of the mighty Isterbrack. But, but I was just looking through his race record this morning, GC. It's it's incredible what this horse did. They like Talk about breaking the mould. I mean, he won 29 times in total, but he's a horse that he got beaten in his first five bumpers. He got beaten in his first four maiden hurdles. He won a maiden hurdle right at the back end of April. So back in those days, he was no longer a novice. So he had to go straight into handicap company. And he went and won seven handicaps in his first season running in handicaps. He went from 109 to 152, won off all of those marks. Like the, Some of the things he did was just absolutely incredible. Uh, like I said, 29 wins, 11 different jockeys won on him. Um, he never actually won on the flat. Our own Fran Berry got beaten on him up the Coral one day, I noticed that. Jockey <laughs> um, over that. I can yeah. that vividly. So uh, AP got beaten on him, the only only time you rode him so I mean at least Fran is in good company there at least you know so <laughs> but yeah he, he was an incredible racehorse and like yeah. it was an incredible story with the bows at the time that they, they didn't have a big string but they had himself they had Sweet Kiln um, they had Solarina all around the same time which was absolutely phenomenal for a small outfit Yeah, and as you say he, I, I was looking at his record as well and I, I tweeted that he he would run in good company as often in three months as some top jumpers do in three years, but he didn't do it once. He did that sort of three or four times in his career, season by season. He he came out and ran, you know, four, five, six times before Christmas and a couple soon after. It was it was astonishing how um, rugged and consistent he was. That, he was record in hand, that record in handicap hurdles is phenomenal. He ran in nine handicap hurdles and he won every single one of them. He was really? in, <laughs> in handicap hurdles. Yeah, it's... Phenomenal, you know, and like Billy was saying, you know, the way that he rose through the ranks, it was, uh, I know some after it had happened, somebody uh, put up a video on Twitter of the, uh, the Stayers hurdle that Barracuda beat um, Iris, Iris gift. Is gift. He was third in, but my goodness, he went down on his sword, didn't he, that day? Yeah. And uh, 
race, you know, jumps racing to me, it was better in them days because they, they served up races like that. You just don't it, get them like that anymore. If well, that was, was the around... one shame, you know. That was the one shame that he didn't win at Cheltenham because we spoke about it a couple of weeks ago. Ed was on about it after Cheltenham where, you know, the Irish banker doesn't get the roar that it used to get back in the day. If Limestone Lad had won at Cheltenham, they would literally have pulled the roof off because he was that popular, you know. Wonderful horse, wonderful memories and a wonderful way to end this week's podcast. Thanks to GC, Billy and David. Hopefully with a bit of detox and massage, we'll get Matt Brocklebank back to full fitness as well. He'll be joining us to look ahead to the Grand National Meeting. That's next Wednesday's podcast. But before then, best of luck with your own weekend bets. Download the Sporting Life app for the best racing coverage, including live racing blogs, fast results, stable tours, trainer and jockey interviews, expert opinion and tips. 